So um, we've been going through the, uh, the way of joy. The book, this is a discipleship course, is connected with the story of hope. And we're on the very last lesson. And next week we transition to another, back to the Bible doctrines. But I, the, the point of this whole curriculum, and I just gave you like an overview. I didn't go really deep into the, all of it that, um, as I was learning, but um, it, the overview is that there's a big story. And it's good to get the big story so that you can appreciate the details, the, um, I guess the, some of the uh, mysteries of the Bible, some of the things that may be not so clear just to get the, the, the big story, to see things from uh, how we should see it as believers, um, the word of God divides. It's either you, you hear the word of God and you want more, and some hear the word of God and they don't want any more. <laughs> so the word of God divides, and, and so it's, I think it's good to step back, get the big story, that's the story of hope. And then this was the discipleship. It was things that new believers should know. And it's very similar to um, the uh, disciples path, which if many of you are in the cell groups, it's similar to that, some of the principles, things like a boot camp, training for living the Christian life. And we never stop, we never stop training. Sister Sheila? everybody. Um, I was just sharing that what we use in your materials, mm -hmm. that the children uh, could ask some questions. And one of the questions was asked on Thursday was, who made God? Who made God? Because, so mm -hmm. you're right. You know, the more we're giving them, they, they're asking questions. Sister Red is back there so she knows that they ask questions, don't they? And so we have to take time and answer them. Amen. So it's, it's amazing. All right. And, and that's the point of the God's word, and, and well, that's the point of this curriculum. I wanted to, um, I think Sister Sheila took it and implemented it, and that's the point of the, um, the curriculum, to put it into use um, to, to help others to grow. And Sister Sheila's using it for the tutorial program. Um, but it's just a, a little review. Um, two weeks ago, we were looking at the, um, well, this is where we are. We on the, the God. The last topic is God's plan for you, and we were discussing that um, that idea of what God wants for us as believers, and God's plan for you or for us is well. We should be involved with personal evangelism. We should be involved with a local church ministry. That's why many of you are here and personal discipleship. That's the purpose of the cell groups and, and Bible studies. And, and then we looked at uh, helping to start new local churches. Some uh, believers God called to start their own church. And it still goes on. It's we never can have enough ch uh, churches, biblical church, uh, Bible-based churches. And then the very last topic is future missionary service. Um, the Lord calls some of us to go to foreign lands to, to preach and to teach God's word. And uh, some, of, some here have gone to, to, uh, internationally. And some of us, he calls to be local, just to go maybe across the street. And, um, and so we asked the question, is there a need for a new church? And some, and some of your, your replies was, um, this, in, in this city, is sometimes it seems like a, a church on every corner. And, and it could be a need for a, another church because some churches are not sound. The doctrine and teaching is not sound. Uh, and you, when you are, are taught and you're grounded in God's word, you can um, sense when a person is not sound. Uh, so recently I heard, well, someone told me, that I believe that... Uh, Jesus is the son of God, but he's not God. And so we, we had talked about that for a little bit. <laughs> and that's theological. The question's like, who made God is theological. 
go back, that helps you dig, dig, go back, you know, God has all, he's eternal. He's eternal. It's hard for us to grasp that sometimes because of our humanity. And then um, often there are new churches because there are different needs. Uh, and as generations come and go, there are different needs. And so churches come, uh, pop up and, uh, because of these needs. Uh, and we looked at a couple of key scriptures and uh, Acts basics of a Bible-believing church. What, what do you need for a Bi Bible-believing church besides all of the, uh, I will say, the um, government requirements? Spiritually speaking, um, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, this is right after the, the birth of the church. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And in that, in that, in that one verse, we see that there's the apostles' doctrine that we need teaching to go on in a, in a, a local, a Bible-believing church, you need fellowship. They fellowship together, we need fellowship. And communion, taking uh, remembering the, what Christ did, we take the communion every first Sunday or however regular we take it. Some take it maybe every week, and some every three months. And prayers, and we need more. We, we cannot have enough prayer for one another. And often, and then it says in verse 43, um, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. When we are here, the Lord works. He answers our prayers, um, and we sense his presence. So those are some of the spiritual elements of a Bible-believing church. And also there's another, and there are other scriptures that talks about the local church. But in, in Colossians, I always enjoy uh, what Paul uses, that triad, faith, hope, and love. Well, we need that in a Bible-believing church. Cannot have too much faith in Christ cannot have too much hope in, his, in Christ, and, and definitely we can't have too much love, the love of Christ. And so just to summarize what um, we looked at two weeks ago, um, I'll put it this way, and these are probably not, this is not a complete list, but I think these are the basic elements of a Bible-believing church. We need teaching, which is Christ-centered, fellowship, which is Christ-centered, communion, which is Christ-centered, prayers, baptism, the manifestation of Christ, generosity, faith, hope, love, leaders, and teachable believers. So we all, uh, and I, we all need to be discipled. I need to be taught. I have never, I have not arrived. And so, um, but the point is that the main point of the Word of God is the person of Jesus Christ. If we didn't have a relationship with him, we wouldn't be here. So um, this morning, and if you have anything that you'd like to discuss while I'm here, this is the last lesson. Um, you can um, just stop me, anything. And as I'm teaching uh, on foreign missions, if you anything comes to your mind, say, well, this was, uh, it, through the curriculum, this really stood out. Or if you have any criticisms, I can do better. So as I'm teaching this morning, be, feel free to give me some feedback on something that maybe you that stuck in your mind to help you as a believer, or something that maybe could be added to this particular uh, teaching. Um, and so the, it didn't, this last lesson didn't give me a lot of information to um, teach with. It didn't give me any, it just says foreign missions and then add this question, and maybe it's more from, I don't know, whoever is somebody here, we, I think most of us are, I don't know, I, I don't hate, hate to say, but we're, we're up there in age. But it says, <laughs> future, it says future missionary service. And it says, discuss, are you willing to ask God if he wants you to be a missionary at some point in your life? to make disciples in another of the many nations of the world.
That's it. <laughs> That's it. And Sister Sheila. <laughs> I can't tell you enough how it's been a blessing to me uh, being in this uh, Sunday Bible study. Not only do I use it for the uh, tutorial, but also when we have the summer camp and then, of course, with the Spanish class. And we meet twice a week, and sometimes there's only one. But they know that we are preparing to be disciples to Spanish-speaking people. And we're using your format and, uh, and this I can't express to you enough how and my sister's sitting next to me because she's in the class. So we're hoping that pretty soon on one of the mission mission Sundays that we can present something so the church can see how we're not going to a foreign country, but we're preparing for these people right here in our own country. And they are really getting ready. I, 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 it just tear me up, uh, you know, when I see them growing. Because people know that we've been taking the Spanish, they've been taking it for a long time, but you didn't learn English like that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and people have to understand it's a growth, it's a process, it's like a sanctification process with them really being a bilingual speaker, because we get first an English speaker. So to go to learn another language, you have to really embrace it. It's like, you know, you, you wear it every day, like you get up and make a bed, you get up and that's how they have to embrace that. And, that, and so I see the growth there. So we, we're getting ready, Amen. ready for that. Amen. So um, I, th I think of uh, Moses. We're never too too old to uh, to do missionary work, um, and and the God has called us to to um, to grow and to go, <laughs> to connect, uh, grow, serve, and go, and so that's the purpose of of the believer's life and to know and also to know him and enjoy him enjoy the Lord um, and so as I was thinking about foreign, it didn't give me much to, to work with it said foreign missions and, I, and then I thought of Billy Graham he's one of the greatest evangelists of this century and I said well so at the end I'm going to show a clip from Billy Graham he's, he had embodies what evangelism is that was his life God called him. He was humble, and God used him mightily. Uh, so that with that in mind, it's not just remember, and sometimes we get, or I get um, confused. It's not the messenger, but the message. So we all are vessels. We can be messengers. How It seems like Billy Graham had great or oratory skills. and I'm sorry? Yeah, he got saved in the 1940s and, and the Lord just used him and that's the way he looked at his life. The Lord used him to, to reach other people and, and so there's a book that I've been reading called Reverberation and just to bring out the point, it's not the messenger it's the message and so um, in, the, in the book I'm going to read uh, a portion of it uh, this is a He's an African. He lived in Nigeria, and his name is Richard Elalu. Had no interest in actually reading the Bible. He was a Muslim, and after all, he lived in one of the strongest Muslim enclaves in Nigeria. Still, he, he did figure out one way to put the Bible given to him by a Christian to good use. Its crackly, thin pages were perfect for rolling joints and cigarettes. So that's the only purpose he had for, for a Bible. It's just to use it for rolling his own cigarettes. And then, um, uh, then it says, um, papers for rolling our own cigarettes were expensive, Richard said. So we would tear out p pages from the Bibles and use them for our own rolling papers. Um, and then the Lord intervened. On, on one occasion, in 1978, Richard tore a page from the Bible for rolling a joint, but ended up stuffing 
could be stuffing it into, into his pocket. That night, bored and unable to sleep, he pulled the page of the Bible from the, his pocket and read these words from Psalm 34.8. And this is what he read. Uh, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And then in NIV it says, um, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Um, and so that verse, um, it says, Take the one who takes refuge in him. And that word refuge um, could mean shelter. Um, it's protection. It's protection from, from weather. It's, uh, to one of the basic needs of life is to be, is to be protected from the weather, the elements. And so uh, when a person truly um, receives Christ, Jesus is a, a shelter. He's a refuge. Um, he's, he's a shelter from the storms and harshness of, the, of life. And, and then um, it's a, he's a relief from br brutal, the brutal storms of life. And so that, that one verse penetrated his heart. And this is the rest of the story. Um, after he received Christ, um, it says, um, for the next three weeks, he could not get the verse out of his head. He returned to the Christian who had shared the gospel with him. One night, alone in his room, Richard prayed, Lord God, I want to taste you like this verse says. And that same evening accepted Christ as Savior and Lord. Richard's Muslim family and community did not respond very well. At first, they expressed concern. Then they displayed anger. And then he received death threats. Richard was the, the first convert in the community. And so it felt like a grave threat to everyone. Local mosque leaders denounced him on the mosque outdoor loudspeakers. His own father told him that he would rather see him dead. He had to spend every night at a different missionary's house because of the danger. Richard left for another community in Nigeria to attend Bible school. Once that was completed, he returned to his home community to pastor a church of factory and government workers who had migrated there. The death threats then resumed at a rapid clip as well as acts of vandalism against his church building. The police looked the other way. Richard eventually moved to the United States to protect his wife and children and to gain more Bible training. I didn't know him at the time, but Richard and I were seminary classmates. It all started with a Bible verse on a wadded up piece of paper dug out of his pocket. So. We don't know what happens when the words we say to win someone to Christ, the tracts that we give. We don't know how the Lord is going to work, but he can do anything. So it's not the, it's not the messenger, it's the message. The message, and we need to, I need to remember that. Um, and so um, just to, uh, some, he was the first convert in his community. He became a pastor. He came to the United States for protection of family and Bible, for Bible training. Uh, and it all started with a Bible verse on a wadded up piece of paper dug out of his pocket. And one of the things that I've been doing off and on uh, here is the um, love packages. And some of you have probably given me uh, those uh, little books um, to, to uh, box up. And I send them to a foreign country where people don't have uh, 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 biblical material. And um, one uh, sister Dorsey used to help me with that. So I'm going to try to revive that because we don't know. We take so much for granted in this country. We have, we have so many Bibles. We have the Word of God. We have study. We have commentaries. And in some countries, it's uh, poverty. And they don't have those, those resources like we do. Even, you know, there's a, a, another ministry that I've 
the Lord has drawn me to. It's called World Vision. And often I, um, I read their uh, uh, magazine that they put out, I think it's monthly or maybe quarterly. And it just gives me a different perspective. Uh, how much we have in this country. And just for example, in, in this, this um, particular issue is about clean water. How many of us had to worry? In mean, some cities, you have to worry about the water. Like in Philadelphia, I don't drink the. I didn't drink the water there. I would buy bottled water because it's so dirty. It has so much contaminants. But we don't have to worry. Most of us about clean water. And in many countries, the the choice is dirty water. And if they have clean water, it's a blessing. And so we take so much for granted in this country. Um, and so um, just the idea of clean water. And so World Vision is going around um, different nations. They're drilling wells so people can have clean water. Some, sometimes women and children spend four or five hours a day getting water from a dirty source just to have it. And all we have to do is go to the faucet <laughs> and turn it on and guide it and shower, and we, we're OK. So we have a lot of resources in this country and, um, at this point, and so we should really appreciate it. So in, just in, in short, it's not, the, it's not the messenger, it's the message. Um, uh, there's a verse that goes like this um, in that And uh, it, it goes like this in Isaiah uh, 55, 11, so shall my word be, uh, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And um, so whenever we do something in the name of Christ, it's going to have a, it's going to have a, a impact. And so um, I was looking at, thinking about Billy Graham. He embodies foreign missions all over the world. He's known many believers and unbelievers know who he is. And his life, life verse was Galatians 6.14. But God for, forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And so um, the big story in this curriculum, it uh, looks at the word of God from the big story. And as I was reading the um, beginnings, um, this very first chapter, it talks about that it kind of condenses it. In this way, it says creation, fall, redemption, recreation. That's the big story. We live in a fallen wa world because of evil. And we need, all of us need to be redeemed, to, to be saved. And that's the, the big story. And all of scripture, it uh, brings out that theme. The necess necessity that we need to be saved. Um, and so every book of the Bible has, a, in some way, points us back to the person of Jesus Christ. That's the reason he came. Uh, so the, in, the, in the book, um, Disciple, Pathways, uh, Disciple Paths, these four events represent the great story of God, the gospel story. It was the story Richard Elilu, who just talked about, was swept into. And it's the story you have now been swept into. Our lives make sense only as we understand them, understand them uh, according to this backdrop. So, um, and that's the purpose of our lives is to be caught up into the Lord's story, God's story, what he wants, to, to reach others, to live for him. And so his story, God's story, is the story of hope. And many in, in the crowds would come around Christ because I... I believe he had a, a story, a message of hope. People were hopeless, and they wanted to hear 
hear a hopeful message. Some came out of curiosity, and some looking for a miracle. Some maybe looking for a loophole, but some uh, came and they tasted and, and, and they experienced his words, and they said, yes, I want this. And some, just like when we started maybe a year ago, the, the, the seed fell on four different soils. It, it was three-fourths of the, of the ones that heard the, the word of God, they rejected it. But then it came on a good soil, and they, and it uh, took a root, and then it was fruitful. And so it's the same way with God's word all throughout uh, the Bible you see. It's a division. Some want it, and some reject it. And, and, and for example, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about the wise man and the fool. The, the wise man, he heeds God's word. The fool does not. You see that dividing, those who love God's word and those who don't. And so we can expect that. But um, his story, God's story, is a story of hope. It is the final story of all stories. Um, his story is the complete story. You know, when I, I heard of the, uh, the shooting down in Florida, and you hear the, when something like that happens, you hear all this different um, perspectives of what happened. Why did it happen? Will it happen again? Can we stop it? And that's the news story. But in my mind, as I filter that through God's word, I know why it happened. You all know why it happened. <laughs> Man is evil. <laughs> evil is one of the problems with this world. We all, there's an evil, evilness of the world. And there's suffering in the world. And it, it shows the, the uh, fallenness of man's heart. You can take, put man in the perfect environment, and he will still sin because the heart has to be changed. Um, just like Adam and Eve, perfect, the Garden of Eden. And they rebelled. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was looking, I was thinking about that when I went to see uh, the Black Panther. Mm -hmm. How, in, even in that perfect environment, that they, uh, wind, well, he, his father, wound up. Uh, I ain't gonna tell the story, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah, we gonna say it no matter okay. what. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> And so, um, and so the, the story of hope is one of hopefulness. Um, and so his story is the story of redemption and how Jesus, the Son of God, redeemed the world and how he can choose to be a, a part of his story. We all, we, God is calling us to be a part of his, his story. And when we obey him and be obedient and we live for him, that's, we're part of the big story. And, um, and being a part of his story, his struggle. You just look at the, the life of the Apostle Paul. It's not, we're, in a, we're going to delude ourselves if we think there's not going to be opposition, and great opposition, and probably unforeseen and struggle that we don't ever could imagine. And some things, and it's spiritual. I, it's some of the struggles we go through as believers. It's, it's, it's a, a spiritual Warfare, <laughs> spiritual warfare. Um, yeah, we have to pray. And I, and I was three, like three weeks ago. I, I literally was inca incapacitated. <laughs> I was just, I was on my living room floor, and I was writhing in pain. I, I told Kathy, that, please call nine one one. And I don't, I've never had problems with my back, <laughs> and I was in so much excruciating pain, but. I think some of the things that we experience is, is spiritually, uh, it's part of that warfare, spiritual warfare. Um, so um, I, I wanted to, sh I would like to show some of um, Billy Graham. He's, I think he represents as a living, well, he was a living uh, example of evangelism. Yeah. And so, um, but just to, this is, I guess many um, lessons ago, two ways to evangelize. We looked at one of the concepts, it's called initial contact evangelism. There are people we'll meet and we'll never see again. And we may be, the Lord may move us to give them a track, maybe say something, a scripture, and they get saved 
and we may see it, next time we see him, maybe in heaven. And then there's relational evangelism, where we build a relationship, a friendship based on some commonality, and then, or maybe we're born into the same family uh, uh, biologically, and we have a relationship, and in that relationship we share the gospel message. And then it's, you help them to grow. But there are many ways to evangelize. Um, you can go on a foreign mission trip, hand out tracts, um, have a Bible study to introduce others to Christ. You can use sports like pa uh, Pastor Vincent. He used baseball to, to, as a vehicle to, to spread the gospel. Um, you can send biblical materials to other countries. Um, and there's another um, a tool that I think is, is very useful. Um, it's called Reflections. And I think many, many of you have it because I, I felt that it was, it's a good tool to have in the home because all of the lessons of the story of hope is found in this book. And you can you know, put it on your coffee table and sometimes children will come in or whoever and they look at it and they start reading it because the pictures grab the reader's attention and that's a perfect way to, to uh, share, especially with children, indoctrinate them in God's word at an early age. I, what I do is I order these in bulk because it's half price. And if you, you, I'm gonna put it up here if you would like to look through it and you want to get one, I have some at home. It's $20, $20 but if you, if you believe that you, you really, you have children in your home and I can really use it, <laughs> you know, willing to work with you on that, but it cost me $20 and um, you can come up and look at it after the class. And this is another way to spread the gospel. It's a great, uh, it's a great uh, story book. One of my earliest, um, oh yeah, and that's God's Word Made Plain. That's a good one too, Sister Loretta. Um, one of my earliest experiences was my aunt. I was five years old and she had, it was a Bible story book. And she's reading me this Bible story book. And I just, one of the earliest memories. Um, so right now, are there any uh, comments or questions? I'm going to play a clip from uh, Billy Graham um, about 20 years ago. He gave a message. But, uh, any, any comments or questions?
And we were meeting in that room, the statue room. About 300 of them were there. And I said, there's one thing that we have in common in this room, all of us together, whether Republican or Democrat, or whoever. I said, we're all going to die. And we have that in common with all these great men of the past that are staring down at us. And it's often difficult for young people to understand that. It's difficult for them to understand that they're going to die. As the ancient writer of Ecclesiastes wrote, he said, there's every activity under heaven. There's a time to be born, and there's a time to die. I've stood at the deathbed of several famous people whom you would know. I've talked to them. I've seen them in those agonizing moments when they were scared to death. And yet, a few years earlier, death never crossed their mind. I talked to a woman this past week whose father was a famous doctor. She said he never thought of God, never talked about God, didn't believe in God. He was an atheist. But she said, as he came to die, he sat up in the side of the bed one day and he asked the nurse if he could see the chapel. And he said for the first time in his life he thought about the inevitable and about God. Was there a God? A few years ago a university student asked me what is the greatest surprise in your life? And I said the greatest surprise in my life is the brevity of life. It passes so fast. But it does not need to have to be that way. Werner von Braun, in the aftermath of World War II, concluded, quote, science and religion are not antagonists. On the contrary, they're sisters. He put it on a personal basis. I knew Dr. von Braun very well. And he said, speaking for myself, I can only say that the grandeur of the cosmos serves only to confirm a belief in the certainty of a creator. He also said, in our search to know God, I've come to believe that the life of Jesus Christ should be the focus of our efforts and inspiration. The reality of this life and his resurrection is the hope of mankind. I've done a lot of speaking in Germany and in France. And in different parts of the world, 105 countries, it's been my privilege to see him. And I was invited one day to visit Chancellor Adenauer, who was looked upon as sort of the founder of modern Germany since the war. And he, went, and he said to me, he said, young man, he said, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And I said, sir, I do. He said, so do I. He said, when I leave office, I'm going to spend my time writing a book on why Jesus Christ rose again and why it's so important to believe that. In one of his plays, Alexander Solzhenitsyn depicts a man dying who says to those gathered around his bed, the moment when it's terrible to feel regret is when one is dying. How should one live in order not to feel regret when one is dying? Blaise Pascal asked exactly that question in 17th century France. Pascal has been called the architect of modern civilization. He was a brilliant scientist the frontiers of mathematics, even as a teenager. He is viewed by many as the founder of the probability theory and the creator of the first model of a computer. And of course, you're all familiar with 
November 23rd, 1654, Pascal had a profound religious experience. He wrote in his journal these words, I submit myself absolutely to Jesus Christ, my Redeemer. A French historian said two centuries later, seldom has so mighty an intellect submitted with such humility to the authority of Jesus Christ. Pascal came to believe not only the love and the grace of God could bring us back into harmony, but he believed that his own sins and failures could be forgiven. And that when he died, he would go to a place called heaven. He experienced it in a way that went beyond scientific observation and reason. It was he who said the well-known words, The heart has its reason, which reason knows not of. Equally well-known is Pascal's weakness. Essentially, he said this, If you bet on God and open yourself to his love, you lose nothing, but even if you're wrong. But if instead you bet that there is no God, then you can lose it all in this life and the life to come. For Pascal, scientific knowledge pales besides the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God was far beyond anything that ever crossed his mind. He was ready to face it when he died at the age of 39. King David lived to be 70 a long time in his era. Yet he too had to face death. And he wrote these words, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. This was David Benson, the three dilemmas of evil, suffering, and death. It can be yours as well as you seek the living God and allow him to fill your life and give you hope for the future. When I was 17 years of age, I was born and reared on a farm in North Carolina. I milked cows every morning and had the most of the same cows every evening when I came home from school. And there were plenty of them that I, that I was responsible for. And I worked on the farm and tried to keep up with my studies. I didn't make good grades in high school. I didn't make them in college until something happened in my heart. One day I was face, face to face with Christ. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Can you imagine that? I am the truth. I'm the embodiment of all truth. He was a liar. Or he was insane. Or he was what he claimed to be. Which was. I had to make that decision. I couldn't prove it. I couldn't take it to a laboratory and experiment with it. But by faith, I said, I believe him. And he came into my heart and changed my life. And now I'm ready when I hear that call to go into the presence of God. Thank you, and God bless all of you. And I was at a, a, a lecture he was giving at a, a scientific uh, gathering, and uh, I thought it was very appropriate. Any comments or questions um, before I close out? Okay. And um, this, is, this is the last lesson for the Good Soil uh, Way of Joy. And what I would like is if you have any comments and, uh, or suggestions, criticisms, I can always do better in teaching. And, um, but if you have any um, comments on those who've been here uh, off and on, or some more consistently than others, but uh, just let me know. But let's um, close in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for your 
your word. Thank you, Lord, for uh, who you are, um, how you do lead and guide us and, and teach us. Thank you, Father, for being a part of our lives. We, uh, we pray that we can be more obedient uh, to your word, um, help us to be more effective as, in evangelism, and thank you for who you are. You are Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and our uh, hope uh, for tomorrow. So uh, thank you once again. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.